I thank you, Asher. And it's very nice to meet all of you today. We uh, started this company back in 2013, uh, developing the technology, got funding in 2015, it's all private funding to date. And uh, what we're gonna talk about today is the future. This is an emerging technology. Uh, in approximately 2013, I noticed that this technology was unique and had some very tremendous benefits compared to what's out there today. So next slide, please, Asher. On the commercial side, we have demonstrated repeatedly that this technology has tremendous advantages in e-mobility, in energy storage, and electronics. And that advantage is, is that we can weld materials such as batteries, battery packs, aluminum, titanium, much better and much faster than the conventional techniques that are out there today. What that does is it dramatically improves the reliability of these batteries. And in addition to that, the performance of these batteries by reducing the uh, inherent losses in these batteries due to poor welds, we see uh, better uh, current capabilities, less heating and longer lifetimes. This also applies to any type of electronics, and electronics typically and other thin type materials. And the reason why this works is that the blue laser technology is quite unique. Blue, as is, is in my background, is the color of the laser that we build. That light, that wavelength, is absorbed very heavily by all materials, much, much better than its infrared counterparts. As a consequence, it's the ideal solution for welding batteries and battery packs and electronics. But we've also recently started looking at directed energy and what could you do there with a blue laser technology. As I mentioned, all materials absorb the energy more efficiently than the infrared source. The direct energy weapon shown on the far left is the uh, system that's using a roughly one micron wavelength source. And the absorption differences of that white coating it has can range from a few percent for the infrared source to 10, 20, or even 30% for the blue laser source. What that means is, is that you need less power on target to do damage. From a system point of view, it's ideal in terms of swap, size, weight, and power. If you need less power on target, guess what? You need to produce less power at the origin. Or if you have even higher uh, power or, or higher resistant targets, such as hypersonics, uh, you now have the ability to address those with very, very high power laser systems. The other area where we've recently started exploring what these lasers can do is additive manufacturing. We have introduced recently with a number of demonstrations, a blue laser into an EOS M100 machine. And we've immediately determined that it's a much, much better solution than what's out there today. We also have plans for scaling that to very large scale additive manufacturing. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna cover in order what I just talked about. In terms of DEW, we have looked at the shorter wavelength. We've looked at the ability to transmit that shorter wavelength through the air. That's one of the key aspects of trying to attack a target. What we've discovered is that the blue wavelength transmits just as efficiently through the air as the IR. But there's two major advantages, the absorption, as I've mentioned, and also the ability to put a smaller spot size on the target for a given beam director. What that smaller spot size means is faster kill times. And as a consequence, in the link studies we've done, we, still, we see kill times for equivalent laser powers, factors of two or greater than the infrared. We've also recently completed an AppWorks phase one SBIR. And here we were doing some tests on counter drone. As you can see on the right, we can essentially blind the drone at, at tremendous distances. In fact, we can build a handheld system that can dazzle that drone at ranges in excess of 30 miles. We also can build relatively small systems that can completely fatally damage the drone. Again, because of the high absorption of characteristics of the blue light on most materials, the time to kill is dramatically reduced and the size of the system required to do damage is dramatically reduced. 
In the case of many of the counter UAS systems out there in the infrared today, they're looking at nominally 10 kilowatts of laser power. And we've been able to show with just one and a half kilowatts of laser power, we could do the same job. Next slide, please. This is an example of the battery welding that we're able to do and the bus bar welding. As I mentioned, the blue laser light is highly absorbed by copper and by aluminum. As you can see in the lower left corner, an absolute pristine weld of a battery pack. That's to be compared with what they use today, which is primarily ultrasonics. Uh, and that results in relatively poor welds. And in fact, those welds require a lot of space, which reduces the energy packing density of the battery. So we can improve the energy packing density, we can improve the reliability, and we can improve their performance. Aluminum, same thing. And then in terms of bus bars and hairpin, same thing. Hairpins, by the way, are the little electrical wires that are in the motors that make it work. Okay. Today, we've distributed over $2 million with the beta laser sales. Uh, approximately 80 companies are working with our lasers today, and we're currently in our product launch phase. Next phase, next page, too, please. 30 second warning. This is an example of the EOS M100 machine with the blue laser integrated in it. On the right is some metallurgical analysis of stainless steel on the top and copper on the bottom. In the center is experimentally determined advantages for using a blue laser compared to an infrared and the improved printing speeds that can be accomplished. And in the case of copper, we were able to enable this small system to be able to print copper and it could not when we received it. As a consequence, the printing ratios uh, for this system are very, very high when using copper and a blue laser. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our team, myself, the founder and CEO, and all of our uh, executives have over 30 years experience in building companies, founding companies, and growing companies. We have a strong R&D presence as well as a strong operations group. Next slide, please. So in summary, we've got significant commercial traction demonstrated in the battery manufacturing segment. Uh, we've just started talking to DOD folks this year. Uh, we've got multiple customers we've engaged. We're seeking partners and funding for expanding um, our involvement in DOD projects. So we'd love to talk to anybody who's looking at future technology. And last slide, please. Next slide, Escher. This is, this is our facility, as you can see, founded in 2015. It consists of R&D, manufacturing, sales and marketing. It's about 30,000 square feet where we're working on applications in welding, 3D printing and defense applications. Thank you very much and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Mark. All right, we're gonna open the floor up, um, feel free. Whoever wants to, to, to kick it off. Yep, Dash, you're up. Hey, Mark, uh, I saw your uh, uh, slide in which you mentioned about your uh, phase three MOU that you're looking for. Uh, 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 basically, I think you're looking for a TPOC for that. Uh, who, uh, who are your potential uh, Air Force uh, end users that you feel uh, you need to reach out to because I could help at that side. Okay, we, we have reached out to a number of end users in the Air Force. And what we're really looking for is some early development funds under that phase uh, two contract. And so um, we have to find someone in the Air Force because it's an AFWORKS program. And uh, we've reached out to AFRL folks. We've reached, and we reached out to both the folks down at Albuquerque and the folks out in uh, uh, right, Pat, um, but we also be open to talking to others if you may know some more we can look, look for. We have not yet been able to secure that MOU. Sure, I can, uh, I'll drop my uh, email uh, uh, and uh, we can connect. Uh, I think I can help you find the right person. Thank you, Dash, appreciate it. Perfect. Um, Felix? Felix, you're up. Hey, Mark. Um, so a lot of the comparisons you made were to IR lasers. Um, I was wondering if you could compare your blue laser to a um, high-powered microwave. So when would your solution be advantageous or maybe um, not as good in comparison to a high-powered microwave when it comes to something like base defense? So are you referring to using um, high-powered microwave against personnel or against equipment? Against equipment. 
Um, so UAS as an example. Or I think you also mentioned, um, I think you mentioned missiles in your briefing. Yeah, the missiles is more long-term. I mean, that's that's years of development that have to be done. The counter UAS, um, within, within uh, two years, we can have an operational unit for testing. And we believe based on the testing we've done so far, uh, first off, we can reach out at distances microwaves could only hope to, and that is we can start dazzling at over, you know, 30 miles, which means that we can take away their visual acuity, their inability to identify, locate targets and waypoints, and then they have to go entirely on inertial or GPS. Combined with a radio jammer, you can knock out the uh, that guidance, and then combined with uh, the ability to do a fatal damage when it gets in close. So you have a multi-layered defense against UAS, and that is what we're looking for the MOU on, I should, I should comment. All right, thank you.